everyone, welcome again to uh, UKSPS seminar. Uh, today we have Herbert Bowles, who is the professor of systems and network security at Fry University Amsterdam, uh, where he co-leads the VUSEC research group. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Cambridge uh, in the computer lab. And uh, he actually did uh, systems work uh, before and then briefed to uh, security a few years ago. Uh, his research interest covers all aspects of system level security and the reliability, including uh, software hardening, uh, exploitation, microarchitectural attack, binary analysis, uh, fuzzing, side channels, and the reverse engineering. Uh, with his students, he has won five Pony Awards uh, at Black Hat, uh, all for novel attacks related to hardware. Uh, I guess no wonder he's very proud of his students and former students. <laughs> so uh, today he will talk about attacks on hardware and how it's going to ruin uh, our lives. Uh, I will pass the stage to you. Yep. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, yes, uh, so Herbert Boss from VUSAC, and I'm going to tell you how you too can ruin your life with uh, security research on uh, on hardware attacks. Okay, and um, I want to point out VUSAC is a system security research group, which is um, uh, interesting in the sense that, uh, that we do security research, but none of the faculty are real security experts by training. We came from systems and therefore the topics that we look at are systems topics close to the hardware. We have very little understanding of cryptography or other you know, mathematically rigorous uh, kind of security. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you're gonna catch me out on, the, on those, uh, those topics. But uh, systems uh, issues we do a lot of, and sometimes there are some, um, some interesting results that, uh, that make it to the news. Uh, and, or you know, win Pony Awards or what have you, uh, and that's I think where the uh, the misconception that Vusak is all about attacks occurred. And I want to correct this uh, right at the beginning of this talk. We don't just do attacks at all. In fact, at least half of our research is on defenses, trying to you know learn from the attacks, the the weaknesses that we find, and then see if we can. Uh, protect our systems against this with better defense. And here are some papers of uh, things that we did in the past, lots of publications that we have in the area of, uh, of defenses. And um, just like everybody else in the past 50 years, when we build a defense, <clears throat> we build the defense assuming that we had a base, a foundation on which we could build, and that this foundation, the base on which we could build was the hardware. We assumed that the hardware was trustworthy, was secure. And we now know, and this has certainly become apparent in the you know, recent years, that this is no longer true. So our assumption is wrong. The hardware is full of vulnerabilities, be it the DRAM chips, uh, your memory chips, or your, um, your CPU itself is full of vulnerabilities. And you may wonder why would I care? Well, you should care because it means that even if you have completely bug-free software, completely formally verified, it's still vulnerable because the foundation itself is vulnerable. Okay, and, um, and since we in our group have some uh, experience in this, right? So we have a lot of uh, papers on attacks, right? So we actually did a lot of attacks on um, a memory chip, so DRAM attacks, Bowhammer related vulnerabilities, but also on CPUs, we, uh, um, have a lot of papers in this area, a lot of uh, uh, work on, on some of these offenses. And I thought by now there's enough of a body of work that we can start looking back and uh, see you know, from our experience what we can learn from this. What are the lessons that we uh, can learn from, from our you know, experience uh, with this, uh, these kind of vulnerabilities? And I have you know, two topics that I can uh, pick from in this, uh, this area. It's the, uh, the transient execution attacks, so the things that we find in CPUs and the, uh, the things that we, uh, we find in, uh, in DRAM chips, in memory. And, uh, you know, I could, you know, both talks I, uh, I, I could give, but I thought it would be nice because I think yesterday there was a new paper on Rowhammer um, with uh, one of our, um, our students uh, as, as one of the, uh, the authors here. 
and one of our ex students is one of the uh, the other authors and one of our um, our faculty our you know our, our ex faculty has now moved to eth as one of the authors i thought it might be nice you know given the occasion and it hit the news somewhat that uh, that it would be nice if we talk about rohammer and the rise and rise and rise of rohammer so uh, let's do that and uh, and dive in so the rohammer vulnerability is both a very strange bizarre kind of vulnerability and also a really simple one if we look at memory, it simply consists of these rows and rows and rows of bits, right? So here are rows of bits. And whenever we want to read some value from memory, what we do is we activate one of these rows and then copy it into this row buffer and then ship it to the CPU. Um, but when we do that, these bits, these cells, which are ju essentially just capacitors with a transistor, uh, are packed so closely together that when we activate this row, there is interference with neighboring rows. And what may happen is that a tiny little bit of charge may leak from this capacitor in a neighboring cell. And if we keep um, accessing the rows that are adjacent to this particular row, this charge leakage may accumulate to the point that at some point, the value of the bit changes from a one to a zero or a zero to a one, a bit flip. Okay, this may happen, may not happen, right? It depends, uh, it's a, it's a, it seems to be a little bit random. Uh, so we don't know in advance whether a bit will flip and which bit will flip. But we do know that if a particular bit flips when we do this, it will probably flip again if we do it again. So it's a repeatable process. And that means that as an attacker, you can use this. It's an uh, a, a good weapon for an attacker to use because what you can do is see say if you can run execute uh, if you can run code on this uh, machine you can allocate a lot of memory access it very aggressively and see which bits have flipped and then return the memory memory of those uh, vulnerable uh, words back to the system let somebody else use that memory and then hammer again and then you flip a bit in somebody else's memory Okay, now Rohammer was discovered, you know, depends who you talk to, but uh, let's say uh, there was some uh, notion of this in uh, 2012, but it was investigated for the first time in 2014 by some folks at CMU. And uh, within a year, there was already a first exploit developed by Google Project Zero. And around that time, we also started looking at this, and uh, not just us, but we were wondering whether it's a very serious vulnerability that, for instance, could attack consumer machines from their browser, right? So from their from JavaScript and some other people also looked at this. Uh, that's the Rohammer JS uh, work, but we looked at it from you know the perspective of, the perspective of can we use this Rohammer vulnerability to attack what was then the most secure browser that was available, which is Microsoft Edge, um, completely from JavaScript. Assuming there are no software bugs whatsoever, completely without any software bugs. Okay, and this was um, work done by uh, our PhD student Eric Bosman, and uh, what he did was, um, uh, uh, in a nutshell, really high-level overview of the attack, craft a fake object. So he, in JavaScript, he created the bytes that you know looked like it was uh, they were uh, uh, the bytes of a real object containing a leaked, so uh, uh, something that we leak, a code pointer and a leaked data pointer. Okay, and um, once we have this fake object, uh, if this method, the, uh, the code pointer was actually executed, was actually used by the runtime, it would execute the attacker's code. Okay, some code that the attacker controlled. So what we did uh, next was to make sure that a legitimate, pointer to a real JavaScript object would be changed by the system such that the runtime would think this is now a legitimate object. And then once we actually uh, access the, uh, the method of the, the original object, it would actually execute some code at the attacker control. That's in a nutshell. So how did that work? Well, it consisted of two main parts. There was a side channel, which we used to leak these addresses, the code address and the data address. Okay, and the, uh, the side channel is a software side channel based on memory deduplication, which is a really simple technique to reduce the memory footprint of a system. 
let's say we have two processes with a virtual address space that you see here and here, and then there is some physical memory. And let's say that both processes have this image in memory. Okay, so it will be somewhere in the virtual address space, and that will be backed by physical memory so in DRAM, right? And the other process has the same uh, image in memory, so it will also have the same content in physical memory. Now, what memory deduplication will do, and this was turned on by default in, in Windows 10, is it will periodically sweep through memory and say, hey, look, these pages of memory, these four kilobyte chunks, are exactly the same in these two address spaces. Uh, it would be a shame to store it twice in physical memory. Let's just remove half of them, remove the um, duplicates, and, um, and map both of these images on the same physical page, uh, page frame. So the, uh, the virtual pages of this process and the virtual pages of that process would be mapped by only a single copy in physical memory. Of course, this copy needs to be mapped copy on write because whenever someone process A, process A starts modifying a page here, you don't want those changes to be seen by process B. So it's copy on write. Now, that's a very good way to reduce the, um, uh, the memory footprint, but it also um, you know, gave us the feeling that maybe there's a security issue here because this deduplication clearly works across security boundaries. We have two processes and memory deduplication occurs. And this should at least give the attacker some coarse grained side channel if we can detect that this is uh, happening. For instance, if we can detect that this page in our process has been deduplicated. We know that the victim also has the exact same content in memory. In other words, we leak information about what the other process has in memory. Okay, it's a coarse grain side channel, so it's four kilobytes, but at least it's a side channel. And it turns out that it's really easy to detect that this deduplication has happened because if you write to such a page, it takes much longer. Think about it. If you write to a normal page, it's simply a write to your memory chip, to DRAM. Okay, so it's very fast. But if you write to a page that's been deduplicated, in other words, that's copy on write, well, a lot of work needs to be done, right? So we need to uh, trap into the kernel because the page is protected. And then the kernel needs to copy that page, all of the content. It needs to fiddle with the page tables. Then it needs to return to user space. And only then we can write to this page. So that takes a measurably long time. And you can measure this even from JavaScript in those days. Okay, So we can detect that a page has been deduplicated. And in other words, we can leak some information about some other processes address space. Okay. Now, the problem is that this is a very coarse grained side channel. So it's four kilobytes uh, chunks that are deduplicated. That's a lot, right? So, uh, so we can leak at the granularity of four kilobytes at a time. And in our attack, as I mentioned, what we wanted to craft is this fake JavaScript object, which contains um, a code pointer and a data pointer. So we want to leak the code pointer and we want to leak the data pointer. And those are not four kilobytes, they're 64 bits or really just 48 bits. So can we generalize this to something that is much smaller? And the, in other words, the secret that we're interested in, in this particular case, the code pointer and the data pointer are only very small. And we leak things at the, um, uh, the entire memory page. Okay, and I see that there's some activity on the chat. Is that... Uh, um, yeah, it's a question to you about, about I thought the bit flipping was due to the fault in the hardware that you were flipping it. And because of some imperfection in the hardware, then this bit was being flipped. But then you were saying wherever this memory block is copied, the bit will continue to be flipped. So it doesn't seem to be due to the actual hardware because no. it happens anywhere. On, in the, it seems to be due to the actual block of memory and how the memory is constructed. No, no, no. So it's it's actually an imperfection in the hardware. So it is the fact that the you know these bits are so densely packed that uh, that you get interference. That is part of a, you know a hardware vulnerability. It really is a problem in the hardware. Is this block of memory that is being deduplicated that leaks information? So it's it's two different things, right? So this is all what I'm talking about now 
is still unrelated to, uh, to the Rohammer vulnerability. So this is more on leaking information about the memory layout of the, uh, the process. So here the attacker is trying to figure out where is some interesting code that I can use to run something maliciously. Does that make sense? Is that sufficient of an answer? Oh, so, so these are two different two different vulnerabilities you're talking about. Indeed, I thought, yes. they, I thought they were the same one. Sorry, okay. No, no, no. Okay. All right, so, so what we want to do, and I'm just click away the chat window. What we want to do is leak this, you know, fine-grained information, the code pointers, using this, um, this coarse-grained side channel. And, um, and to do that, what we have to do is turn this secret into a page, right? So because that's the only level at which we leak information. So what we need to do, in other words, is make sure that the secret address, the code pointer or the data pointer, has to be put on a page of which all the rest of the content is known, right? And then once we know the rest of the content, the only thing we need to do is guess uh, the the value of this uh, this page. If we guess the value of this uh, sorry of this address, if we guess the value of this forty eight bit address correctly, the page will be deduplicated. If we do not guess it correctly, the page will not be deduplicated. Okay, so that's in general the idea. And if the address was only one byte, this would be really simple, right? So then we simply the attacker can create two hundred and fifty six pages with different guesses for this one byte. And then write to all of those pages and then see um, which one gets duplicated. And that must have been the right value for that byte. Now, obviously, 48 bits, that's a lot of pages to create. So we don't really do that. Uh, we use all sorts of trickery to make sure that only a very small part of the address gets mapped onto this page. So this is really easy when we generate um, JavaScript. So we create JavaScript functions. And they get generated, and uh, they generate x86 uh, instructions, and we know which instructions will be generated when we have specific JavaScript uh, uh, code. So it's completely predictable. All of this is known, and by making the um, the functions longer or shorter, we can make sure that an address gets you know one byte or two bytes on a particular page or you know more more bytes on the particular page so we make sure that there's only one or two bytes on this particular page so that we can create 256 pages guess the right byte and then we do it again for the next part so it's um i'm hand waving my way through this but this is a, a general trick that we use to leak this information so we use this memory deduplication and i'm only sketching uh really uh, the, uh, the the high level idea of this memory deduplication side channel to leak this uh, this address space layout randomization and there's a lot more to it. If you're interested, you should look at the uh, the paper. It's super complicated, I think. Right, and then we combine this with the Rohammer vulnerability. Once we have the information, we have this fake JavaScript object. We have this. Uh, we combine it with the Rohammer vulnerability to actually gain control. How does that work? Well, like I said, we craft using these leaked addresses, we craft a fake JavaScript object in memory. And then the other thing that we do as an attacker is template the memory. So we allocate a lot of memory and start hammering away. And we find that, for instance, at this particular location, bit number three will flip because of row hammer. And at a different location, bit number four will flip and so on. Okay. And now what we do is we create a real object, a real JavaScript object with a reference to it. And we make sure, so here is um, our real object and there's a real reference to this real object, okay? And we make sure that this is mapped exactly at the location that is susceptible to row hammer, okay? So now we know that if we start hammering uh, for this location, the bit will flip and we know exactly that it's going to be bit number three that's gonna flip. And that also means that we know exactly where the pointer is going to point to and we make sure that it's at that location that we have our fake JavaScript object. So now, whenever, so as far as the JavaScript runtime is concerned, this is now a legitimate object. And when the program starts executing a method on this object, it will really be executing the code that the attacker controls. Okay, that's the 
um, attack, and that will win you, uh, 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 in those days at least, uh, a Pony Award for most innovative research. What I want to emphasize, though, is that all of the cleverness here is in this software trick. Most of the things I talked about, in fact, was you know all of this memory deduplication stuff, and that's uh, that's where a lot of complicated things were. But it turns out that these were relatively qu uh, uh, quick to do, and in fact. On the day of the deadline for the conference, we figured out that something didn't work. Uh, unexpectedly, something didn't work. And then Eric, within six hours, came up with an entirely new design, implemented it, evaluated it, and put it in the paper. So that's within six hours. On the other hand, the really simple thing was just getting the bloody bit flip at uh, a normal uh, DRAM module, a DIM. Uh, at native refresh rates for that uh, memory module. And that took months just to get that bit flip. And it's not because it's complicated. Once you know the exact parameters to use for that, uh, for that module, it's really simple. You actually get the bit flip fairly quickly. But trying to get that took Eric months and made his uh, head explode. But the key thing is that once you know that, it's actually really easy. And the next attack that we tried where we try to you know, see whether we could apply this also in the cloud was really easy. And this was work by, uh, by Ben Gras uh, mostly. And again, it used this Rowhammer hardware glitch together with memory deduplication, but in a novel way to um, attack uh, a VM from a neighboring VM in the cloud. Okay? And the idea is really simple. We have again, memory deduplication, also known as kernel same page merging in KVM. And uh, we have a situation where we have two virtual machines on the same hardware, and one of the virtual machines is owned by an attacker. Okay. And um, since there's memory deduplication, if the same page exists in two VMs, that page will be merged and mapped onto a single physical page frame. And that will then be used by both of those virtual machines. But now we don't use this to leak information, but we use it to steer the victim VM to use a physical page frame that we control. We decide which physical page frame the victim will use. In this case, it's this page frame, and it's the, a page frame that we selected, okay? Um, and that's good because now we can pick a page frame that we you know, uh, previously de determined to be susceptible to row hammer. And now if we start hammering this page, it will flip a bit in this page. And that page is used also, not just by ourselves, but also by the victim. In other words, we flip a bit in another VM's page. Okay. Now, the question is, what can you flip? What is interesting to, uh, to flip that will actually create a security problem? And also it has to be some page of which we know the content, right? Because otherwise it will not be deduplicated. And so what we did, there's lots of things that you can try. What we did was the following. First, we tried to SSH from our machine into the victim machine. Of course, this fails, right? Because we don't know the um, corresponding SSH key. But what will happen is that the victim will load the authorized keys file in memory and the authorized keys file contains so this fails the authorized keys file contains the public key of the administrator of this machine and the public key by definition is not secret so if you just go to github you can actually see all of these public keys so we know the public key of the administrator and we create a page with that public key and simply wait until these two pages get merged, get, get deduplicated. And then we start hammering this, okay? Then we start hammering this, and what will happen is that a bit will flip in this public key, okay? So also for the victim. And um, these public keys are not just random numbers. They're chosen because it's really hard to factorize and create a private key by just looking at the, uh, the, uh, the public key. However, this is no longer true if you flip a bit in, uh, in this number. With almost 100% um, of the cases, if you flip a bit, you generate a weak key, okay? A weak key where it's really easy to generate the corresponding private key. And we could do that in minutes. So anyway, 
Um, what we uh, showed that we could do with that is, uh, is break the internet. And you can see that Kave and Ben are really happy with, uh, with themselves for doing so. And, um, and that was great, but it's really, it was a, a really easy attack for us to do because we already knew how to get that bit. Now we've shown that we could do it on the PC. We've shown that uh, it also translates to the cloud. The next thing we wanted to do was see whether it also uh, applies to you know, consumer devices that we wear on, on, uh, on our person all the time, so mobile phones. And it turns out this was a nightmare because these memory controllers are slower. The entire system is, uh, is much, uh, much different. And none of the x86 techniques that we tried worked. And we tried really hard. Uh, and it simply didn't work. And this was the work by Victor here. Okay. And, um, and it, it, months went by because we didn't understand why it, didn't, it wasn't possible. We tried at some point to write a kernel module that just um, uh, tried to access memory in a, a DRAM module that we knew was likely to be vulnerable, hammering really hard from the kernel. And then we actually did see bit flips. So it's not that the memory controller was necessarily too slow. If we look at these graphs, we see um, the number, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the, the speed, oops, the speed of the, the read. So here the speed is really uh, low. We add a lot of knobs in between reads. So the read becomes low. There's a lot of time between the reads. And, uh, and, and here the speed is very high. And we can see that the number of bits that flip, so the number of Rohammer bit flips actually goes up with um, the speed of the, the reads, okay? Strangely, it actually goes down here a little bit. We couldn't really understand what was going on and we speculated that maybe the memory controller reorders some of the accesses, but we didn't know. We only figured out later what was the likely cause of that. Anyway, there were bit flips and eventually we managed to get it done, but the reverse engineering of what was going on was um, uh, a real nightmare. So, uh, so we'd won some prizes, but, um, but you know, it made um, Victor age 20 years, right? So this just his reverse engineering process was a, a terrible, uh, terrible ordeal that he went through. And we could only do it from native code at that stage. So the next thing that we tried to do is now we've done this, uh, this on ARM, can we also do it on uh, you know, JavaScript from the browser? Because there was some, uh, discussion about this on Twitter and saying that, you know, maybe this is not a big deal. The, the, um, the, the bit flips that you got, it doesn't put millions of devices at risk. Um, but, you know, maybe we can do this from the browser and, you know, eh, yeah, maybe you can do that. Um, so we, th we thought that's a challenge. And that was the, uh, the next thing that we tried. And it's a word by Pietro. Um, and what we did there was use the GPU, the grand poning unit, uh, for this purpose. So nowadays on mobile phones, you have these processors that are really complicated and contain a lot of uh, co-processors. Okay, for instance, there's a, your CPU, but there's also a GPU and then maybe a TPU and lots of other things. And that means that if you have more co-processors, you also have a greater attack surface. And what we tried to do was use this GPU to launch one of these row hammer attacks. And you can, program the GPU from JavaScript using WebGL, okay? Now, to do this um, required a lot of reverse engineering because we had to understand how this GPU accessed memory, how it actually worked. And to do that, you need to know how the, uh, what caches it has and what, uh, how the caches work. And none of this is documented, so it's all reverse engineering. We also needed some software tricks. For instance, we needed to build our own timers because by now the timers had been crippled by the vendors in order to, uh, to stop these kind of attacks. So we had to craft our own timer. That was really easy. Uh, and we had to figure out how to get a very large contiguous memory area, area. That was also not so hard. But this was actually really hard, okay? And uh, eventually we, we managed to get it done. And I'm not gonna explain every single attack that we did because it's not gonna be, uh, it's, uh, it's not going to fit in the time, um, but um, uh, we did get it done, and uh, we got bit flips on phones from JavaScript. But you know, there's a price that you pay for this, right? So the uh, the amount of work that you put in reverse engineering is just enormous. Okay, so but we've done it now for PCs, the cloud, 
um, um, mobile devices, from JavaScript even, what is left? So one of the things that we, uh, we looked at next was, does this actually pose a threat for remote servers? So, so far we've assumed that um, we have to be physically present with our codes in order to get this, uh, this Rowhammer vulnerability. Well, it turned out that, again, once we knew how to get BitFlips, doing it remotely was not so much of an issue. And there the complexity, so the, uh, the next attack that we tried was doing this remotely. Uh, the complexity was not related to the hardware or to reverse engineering. It was just trying to find, find out how we can exploit an RDMA-based server. Um, so this was a throw hammer, imaginatively called throw hammer, which is just row hammer across the network. Don't want to talk about this because it was really easy to do this. Okay. Now, around that time, there was this, um, this message from Werner Vogels, who is the uh, CTO of Amazon, who said, Look, you know, Rowhammer stuff, it's all great, but I'm not worried. Okay. And why is that? Because you're using cheapo consumer um, memory. And the, uh, the memory that we have in servers is actually much, much better. And that's true because they have, for instance, error correcting code. And error correcting code uh, makes it much harder to launch an attack with bit flips. Okay. Uh, if you have error correcting code, if you get a bit flip, it will be automatically corrected. If there's an error of one bit, it will be automatically corrected. Okay? Moreover, ECC generally is able to do a little bit more than just correct one bit flip, because if you have two bit flips, it will generally detect that something is wrong. And that's really bad, because as soon as you get two bit flips, generally your, your system crashes. Okay? That's end of, uh, game over for the, um, for the attacker. So what you want is three bit flips, such that they do not get detected, okay? So do not get uh, uh, corrected, do not get detected, but you get three bit flips to launch your attack. The problem, of course, is that it's much more likely to get two bit flips than it is to get three bit flips, okay? So you want to craft an attack such that you get three bit flips without getting two bit flips in the meantime. That is a challenge that we have. So one bit flip is no bit flip, it gets corrected. Two bit flips is a crash, you wanna avoid that. Three bit flips is what you want as an attack. And um, this is the work that, uh, that uh, Lucian, our PhD student, uh, started working on. Uh, he didn't know how the ECC functions uh, worked on these, uh, these memory modules um, and didn't actually know anything about these things. And it became this insane reverse engineering process. So it took him two years and there was virtually no progress in those two years. So at least for a year and a half, there was no progress whatsoever. And he, he literally became somewhat depressed because of this, because of this effort, but he wanted to keep at it. And we would walk the corridors and we would see these wafts of freezing spray coming out of his room because he was freezing the memory chips and then ripping them out in a cold boot attack, putting them in another machine, trying to find out what bits there were in these, uh, these ECC um, uh, uh, chunks. Okay, so that was insane. And then at some point uh, he was walking through the corridor. I ran into him and he said, he muttered to himself and I said, you know, so how's it going? And he said, you know, um, I have a problem and, 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 but I think I know how to solve it. I need syringe needles. And I said, whatever the problem is, right? Syringe needles are probably not the answer. But what he meant was this, right? So with the thing that you see here, now let me just enlarge that a little bit. It's got these two syringe needles that plug into these um, connectors of the, uh, the DRAM chips. Short circuiting, if you want, if you, you know, squeeze this, uh, these tweezers, short circuiting very briefly, you know, uh, ground and one data line and creating a specific bit flip, a controllable bit flip. And he could use that to figure out what the ECC function was really doing. And it's really complicated. I don't want to, uh, talk to, uh, uh, explain this in detail, it's not going to fit in this uh, presentation anyway. But what he found was that you can actually launch row hammer attacks still on this memory with ECC uh, protection. And the trick that you use is that you uh, make sure that at most one bit flip um, occurs at a time. And you can do that by selecting data patterns Carefully, if all the bits in the two adjacent rows are exactly the same, you're not going to get a bit flip. So you make sure that all the bits are the same except one. 
and then you get at most one bit flip. And that would be corrected by ECC, but it would leave a side channel. You could detect that the correction had occurred. Okay, and once you know that that bit is um, uh, vulnerable, it could flip, you make the two values the same again, so it won't flip the next time, and you try the next bit in the code word, then the next bit, and the next bit, and the next bit, until you have found a code word where there are three bits that could flip. And then uh, you make all of them different, and you have the, um, uh, the, the required uh, bit flip that you, were, that you were looking for, the three bit flips that you were looking for. Anyway, super complicated. And the reverse engineering process is what I want to focus on. So here you see uh, us, right? So his supervisors were super happy and uh, looking uh, 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 very proud in the camera. But you can see that you know this this PhD student he's seen things, right? So he's uh, he's clearly you know still dazed and confused by uh, by the experience. But now we showed that we could do this in uh, ACC uh, memory, and it turns out that uh, I don't know whether Werner said that, but he still wasn't worried because the new memory that they were actually using in servers was even better. In fact, they were no longer using the DDR3 that we've been playing with, but they were using DDR4 and DDR4 that is explicitly made Rowhammer free. So there are no longer any Rowhammer vulnerabilities is what the memory vendors explicitly said. This is how they advertised their memory. And that is the, uh, the project that, uh, uh, some of our PhD students, Pietro and Emanuele, and someone from ETH, Hassan, started looking at. And uh, they started looking at this defense that was now built in these DRAM chips. And it's known as TRR, Target Row Refresh. And what it would do is simply measure whether or not there's been lots of activations for a particular row. And if so, refresh the rows that are close to it, that could be victims. Okay, so that would never relate, uh, never create any chance of, uh, of, of accidental bit flips. And there are many different uh, implementations, but the modern version that we have there is uh, in DRAM. So the DRAM chip itself will do this, uh, this target row refresh, measure what it's, uh, what it's doing. Okay, and this is what we've been seeing in modern memory chips since uh, 2016. The older version, pseudo TRR, we no longer see used. The problem with doing some analysis on, the, on these chips is that it's very hard to do this from the CPU um, because the, the memory interaction is you know, hidden from, from your code because the memory controller is doing its own thing. And then it's a, it's a synchronous protocol. So you don't really see um, what's happening within as a command, you know that it's it's going to be done within a certain time frame, but you don't really see what's uh, what is uh, is happening. So what we used was an FPGA-based memory controller to probe this and see whether or not things were still possible within this uh, within these kind of memory chips. And we discovered three important things. So first of all, we noticed that this target row refresh was keeping a sampler to track which rows were very active. Okay, and then it used a so-called inhibitor to refresh the potential victims of those aggressive rows. And the third thing we learned was that you know we should have picked a different career because this was uh, so painful. Um, but uh, but what was interesting uh, uh, about the uh, the first thing that we learned is that the sampler could only track a limited number of these rows, so it had a certain capacity. And if we go beyond that capacity, we would um, um, uh, maybe exhaust this. And sure enough, when we tried this, we actually went beyond these, um, uh, say, maybe it could track, say, uh, um, eight rows. If we go beyond eight rows, we would still be able to trigger bit flips because the um, TRR defense could only handle eight very aggressive rows. Okay. And, uh, and here you can see that if we increase the number of aggressors beyond the capacity of this TRR defense, we still get lots of bit flips. Okay? And I don't know, but I can imagine that Werner Vogel must have been a little bit worried about that, at least. All right, but I also, at, at that point, I also became uh, slightly worried because uh, uh, um, this was such a big deal that the university became concerned that maybe the manufacturers 
would sue the university and uh, and so we had to communicate our findings to the manufacturers through some proxy the national Cybersecurity center um, and we set up an anonymous email to communicate with the uh, the manufacturers and it was all the big manufacturers right samsung hynix micron and um, and that not only the lawyers became involved involved but also the rector of the university so uh, who's absolutely awesome and he's unfortunately now moved to a different university but he's absolutely awesome because uh, he immediately said you know we're going to have your back if they sue you uh, and not only that he actually made an effort to read our paper multiple times so he read our paper multiple times and found he's not a computer scientist at all but he found certain uh, problems with the paper and uh, helped us improve the paper awesome guy anyway in the end um, it uh, it led to you know uh, a paper that was accepted, uh, it, it won another pony uh, and won also won a best paper award. But most of the work was reverse engineering and it still didn't work on JavaScript. Okay, so more reverse engineering ensued and we still did not understand what was going on. So Finn, the reader, um, was now uh, looking at this and he couldn't figure it out, right? So this is Going back to the slide that we saw all the way at the beginning, where we didn't understand why if the speed went up, the bit flips would actually uh, uh, disappear. We got this here also. If we started adding more knobs to uh, our reads, right, so to the, between our accesses, we could see that you know there was a long range of uh, of cases where the number of uh, of bit flips would be really low. Right, zero or you know uh, maybe slightly higher than that, and then there would be a small period where you know a small chunk with uh, a number of, of knobs uh, inserted where we got a lot of bit flips, and then a long period again of uh, you know no bit flips whatsoever, and we could not figure out what was going on. And you know it took Finn a year later, uh, a year to uh, to uh, to work on this. Uh, he didn't change at all, right? So he kept being this really happy PhD student. But, uh, but it took him a year to figure out that you have to time your accesses to memory very carefully. You have to time it with so-called refresh commands that are sent to the DRAM chip um, anyway. Um, the details are not so important, but it turns out that once you know this, you get lots of bit flips again, okay? And that's, uh, that's encouraging across all of the... Uh, uh, the, the possible vendors. So this got us uh, the paper on Smash, Rowhammer on DDR4 with DRR from JavaScript. Okay, and now very recently, this new paper came out called Blacksmith, which showed that, you know, there's more reverse engineering that is required if you really want to understand this, because so far we've just been hammering rows uniformly, right? So the same frequency for every um, row. And it turns out that you can play with this and make maybe uh, changes in the, uh, the uniformity there. And it shows that, you know, they got even more bit flips on more dims. Now, that is basically our story on, uh, on Rowhammer. What I want to use the last few minutes for is to talk about not so much Rowhammer by itself, but what we've learned in this process. So all of these papers, I thought they were great papers and, uh, and, and deserve to be published, but but there is something that is that is wrong there, and that is that uh, that we keep doing all this work, uh, offensive research, and I think that is very useful to do offensive research in the general case because it, you know, it makes us understand these really complex systems which we no longer understand. So we learn more if we make these systems do something that they, you know, shouldn't be doing. Unexpected behavior is teaching us something about the systems that we built, and then we can increase security. But what we're doing here is spending all this effort on reverse engineering. We reverse engineer ourselves into the ground. And during this, you know, two years of reverse engineering in the case of Lucia, um, we did not know whether we were ever going to get results. It was just, you know, plodding along, trying this thing, one thing after another, and not necessarily making any progress. And what's worse, we didn't really learn anything new. So we learned something that was new to us, but the manufacturers knew exactly what was in there. So it seems like this, this um, uh, pointless, almost pointless exercise 
to you know uh, obtain the knowledge that, that people simply have, right? So it's all known, but not, not by us. And what we get because of these sort of uh, um, uh, uh, developments was that you get this you know notion of it's it's the manufacturers, Intel versus the researchers, or you know Samsung versus the researchers, which is not healthy. Um, and neither side really wants that, but there's, it's very difficult to avoid this. So I think this security research, because of all of this investment that we have to do, is perhaps not the most healthy environment to be in. Okay, uh, And it's getting harder and harder because as time goes on, it's becoming more painful to figure out what's going in on inside a DIMM uh, memory chips or, uh, or a CPU. And what you get back, because you know the low-hanging fruit has been already gathered by others, is diminishing returns. Moreover, this creates an unhealthy barrier to entry. At some point, you know, a new group at a university that's actually interested in this sort of stuff might like to start doing such research. But you have to have such you know infrastructure and knowledge and expertise beforehand. Um, that it's it's probably not worth doing anymore. And by the way, I do think that uh, reverse engineering in general should be appreciated more. Another problem that I have with this line of research, which we engaged in ourselves, so it's uh, accusing ourselves also, is that to some extent, it, it feels like we're just doing pen testing for free for the vendors, okay, which is not very nice. And also we have to ask ourselves, in the interest of our PhD students, when it's no longer worth doing this, right? So uh, many years ago, in 2000 or so, 2002, um, I ran into Wang Lee, uh, a researcher from Georgia Tech, at a conference, and I asked him, you know, how we, how how is the, uh, the research on network processors going? This was an uh, uh, an Intel processor that we were working on, they were working on, and um, they were. Very nice. There was multi-core, many many cores, um, uh, but they were also a pain to program. And he said, "Like, look, we stopped doing it. We can I cannot burn my PhD students on doing this kind of research. It takes them, you know, five times as long to get any paper published. And maybe this is also the situation that we're in when it comes to hardware, uh, offensive hardware security. And this is unfortunate because." Once we stop looking, right, we, the academic community, the researchers, it doesn't mean that these vulnerabilities are not there. They're still there. And, you know, maybe others with more time, more resources, say intelligence agencies or so, they will uh, put in the effort and they will find these things. Yeah. And the other thing that is problematic about this is, you know, it's very painful to do this. It's, it costs a lot of investment in people time, mostly. Um, um, but it's it's so important to do this because in DRAM, every issue that we find is going to be uh, with us for many years, right? So we have no way of updating DRAM chips. CPUs, we can actually have some firmware updates. DRAM chips, there's nothing we can do. If they're vulnerable, they're vulnerable. And all of the devices that use them are vulnerable, okay? And they will be vulnerable for as long as they're being used, which is the next maybe five years. Moreover, it takes a couple of years to generate um, fixes for these, uh, these kind of vulnerabilities. So it will be with us for uh, maybe seven years. So when the uh, manufacturers advertise row hammer free uh, DDR4, and it's terrible because it, it's giving guarantees that aren't guarantees. And I think it's important for researchers to analyze. So what is the solution? I, I have no idea. Uh, the, uh, the point of view of the hardware vendors is also legitimate. Collaborating with academia is very difficult um, and no easy solution exists. Throwing money at the academics is not really the answer unless maybe it's lots and lots of money. Um, maybe what would help is if we get more control. If there's more things that we can actually uh, experiment with in terms of doing this target row refresh defense, if there's something that we can control more, that would be really nice. We've seen this in networking where we have software defined networking. We have it to some extent in CPUs with um, the new open source CPUs. Um, something like that for memory might be nice also.
To summarize, what I've talked about is this long history from the very beginning of the Rohammer vulnerability until you know, the latest attacks that we've seen. And what we've seen is that Rohammer affects almost all of the DRAM um, memory chips that we've uh, seen you in use in, in, in any system, right? So mobile, cloud, PCs, and so on. And they're gonna be with us for many years still. Okay, we're finding new vulnerabilities now, which means they're going to be in use for the next seven years or so. And the other thing that I concluded was that uh, the way we do offensive research is perhaps not working too well. And I have no good solutions for that, but maybe you do. We find that systems are full of very uh, complex, system, uh, com complex components, and that creates a larger attack service, a lot of shared state, so not so much Rohammer related, but in general, that creates a lot of uh, vulnerability also. So in virtual ground for research, um, we find more vulnerabilities because we now started looking. And once we find a vulnerability, it quickly expands. This is what we've seen in Rohammer so beautifully, right? It starts from an academic curiosity to something that encompasses almost all the systems that we have in use. And unfortunately, it, I would say for PhD students that want to do this, it is a risky area for research. All right, and with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions if there is still time for that. Let me just see how am I doing on time. Yeah, definitely, I guess. We will get some questions. It's really amazing, amazing, I guess. Uh, not just the works, uh, but also the people behind the work. It's really amazing. So, uh, yeah, Lorenzo, you want to ask questions? Just, so just stop ask. Sharing, maybe. Yeah, hi. Hi, Herbert. Hey, Lorenzo. Hey, how's it going? Good. So long it was, time yeah, long time no see. Indeed. Well, a long time I don't see anybody actually. <laughs> that is also true. Um, it's a fascinating talk, and in fact, I tuned in because I knew that you would have given a great talk. I mean, knowing knowing your past experience as a speaker, but also you know following your research and research of Pusak, I mean, this is clearly amazing. Uh, first, I just wanted to maybe start a flame of this, uh, about the subliminal messages of Emacs rules versus VI, but you know, that will be for another story, another time, you know, in front of a beer. Second, so my question is, how necessary is memory, sorry, I'm just trying to lower my hand. So how necessary is memory deduplication now for uh, having successful raw hammer attacks? Not or at it all. depends, no. not at all, right? It depends on the, on the context, right? Yeah. Yeah, this was just uh, an illustration of the, um, you know, how we could launch an attack without having a single software vulnerability, but, but it's just an example. Right, right. So what would be for you a mitigation, a good mitigation until we get to raw hammer free? Yeah, so uh, of course we've asked ourselves that question and we, um, we published a paper on one possible mitigation, but you're not going to like it because it's super expensive. Um, so, you know, one possible mitigation might be to not use all of your memory, right? So, you know, if your neighboring row is the one that is vulnerable, what you could do is throw away uh, every other row, right? So you have a guard row between every, um, every row. The good uh, thing about that mitigation is that you can implement it. This is software, right? So you don't care about the, the hardware. You can do this in software and simply not use it. Or what we did, so we didn't actually throw away every other row, but we used it as swap space that is heavily integrity checked. So even if there is a bit flip in that area, it doesn't matter so much. You're going to detect it. And um, uh, once, there, uh, once you access memory that is in, the, in, in these rows, you simply get it from memory, so it's relatively fast. But it's still a, a, an expensive solution. What I would want from hardware uh, is you know, something better than this, uh, this prefabricated uh, TRR uh, solutions, and maybe just the ability to program this ourselves. So if we as I can, so we have there's a lot of brain power in the world, right? So if we have more control over when you do a refresh and when you sample and you can make trade-offs between how slow your memory gets if you want to do that and how um, uh, strong your security becomes as a, as a result of that, that would be really helpful, I think. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Thanks, Herbert. So I see in the chat, there's a, there's a question that uh, 
but it's always us with these uh, these advanced attack. Are they um, are they used in the wild? Um, my my you know my first response is always how would we look? <laughs> it's uh, it's it's really complicated. Maybe not, right? So this is uh, the suggestion that's typically behind the uh, the question. Um, and um, the the problem is what we're looking for in in you know anti malicious software uh, uh, detectors uh, is uh, patterns that are not this right so uh, so you know if you're you know casting out a net for fish you're not gonna uh, catch any mosquitoes or you know other bugs or you know uh, land animals so the question is are we actually looking for this in the right way? Um, on the other hand, I also think that it's probably not deployed for mass attacks on you know millions of users because then probably we would have detected it by now. But is it used in very targeted attacks? I honestly wouldn't be able to tell. I hope that answers your question, uh, Angus. And then there is a question by Ben. Uh, do the economics involved in discovering and exploiting these problems only really work if you have lots of cheap institutions to spend on the problem? If you're a government agency or a bad guy spending two years on an attack uh, like this versus exploiting various other parts of the world's very wobbly software stack seem much more cost effective. Yeah, I, I think that that's a fair, fair point, right? So, um, so uh, why would you want to spend your euros dollars or pounds in uh, in uh, on working on these these problems well you know it it may be worth your while if you have very specific targets in mind that uh, that have extremely secure systems right so not the 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 most uh, common wobbly software stack that you uh, that you care to attack right so if you're a nation state and you want to attack i don't know say it would never happen right but let's let's assume that they would at some point, attack a uranium enrichment facility in some Middle Eastern country, right? So maybe then it's worth doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fair point, Ben. Right. Uh, there is another question by Paul. Uh, it's, uh, it says, uh, would it be possible oh. to avoid Rohammer problems by upping uh, DRAM refresh rates? And if so, yeah. what's increased? Would would be needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, sorry, I missed that uh, the one. Uh, in, it, it just dropped off my screen. Um, yeah, uh, this was in fact one of the first suggested mitigations against Rohammer, and um, it's it's problematic because uh, you know what what they did was um, doubling the refresh rate. But even if you double the refresh rate, you would could still get uh, get bit flips. Moreover. It makes your uh, your system really expensive, right? Because you're now doing uh, a lot of extra work, and that is expensive in terms of uh, energy consumption. But also, you're taking away some of the useful cycles of your of your memory. So you're slowing down your your memory because the refreshes actually take time, also. Okay, so it's it's taking away capacity from the, from the, from that. How much you would need nowadays? I don't really know. It's a good question because in the old days, bit flips were surprisingly much harder to get. And the reason for that is that the memory was less dense in, in those days. Nowadays, it's super dense. And moreover, the memory uh, manufacturers, manufacturers have uh, started relying on their uh, defense. So maybe they're not so worried about this anymore. So surprisingly, once you know how to uh, hammer, right? So which access patterns you need, the bit flips happen much more quickly. So uh, it's it's a good question, but I cannot answer the, uh, uh, the, the, the question about what increase would be needed at this point. Right. I have two questions, very quick ones. Uh, the first one is uh, when you do row hammer, can you control the location of the uh, Flip. No, but what you do as an attacker, mm -hmm. so in principle, you don't know which bit is going to, uh, to flip at all, right? But what you can do is uh, simply try out, so allocate a large chunk of memory. If you have, have local, uh, if you have code uh, running locally, you can access a large chunk of memory. 
and simply find out which bits flips and uh, which bits flip and then look for the one that you're uh, interested in. Say you need a bit flip on the uh, fifth position. So you keep hammering until you find one word where there's a bit flip on the, uh, the fifth position. You don't know exactly where it's going to be, but you will find eventually on most memory, you'll find it. Okay. And the second question is, can you do row hammer attack on a CPU cache? Um, no, that so the, the memory there is different. It's not uh, not DRAM. It uh, it's it's FRAM based, but um, there there have been other types of uh, um, glitches that uh, that allow you to uh, to to do things there, but not not row hammer. Okay. So uh, yeah, the other solution therefore could be let's all use SRAM for uh, for all of our memory. But that's uh, that's you know insanely expensive, so that uh, cannot be done. Okay. Yeah. I see. There's another question. The simplest solution is just to make memory less dense. Would that be uh, too much of a step towards the past? I'm afraid so. I think that uh, you know, cost-wise, it's it, that's not going to fly. And essentially, by the way, that is uh, also what we did in our defense, right? So the uh, the defense that I described when uh, Lorenzo asked the uh, the question. Of, of not using all of the uh, the rows uh, in the same way, at least, uh, as, a, uh, as a defense to absorb some of the bit flips is also, you know, making the, um, uh, the memory less dense by, by software. But I don't see anybody using that uh, anytime soon. Okay. 